So good morning and thank you all for joining our LABC webinar this morning. Like all of you, LABC went mobile uh, those last month and we wanted a way to be able to communicate with our LABC members and friends. So we launched a webinar series, first focused on the COVID-19 response to homelessness and the housing crisis, and then on the economic impacts um, of the virus. Next week, we're gonna be looking at the effects of the COVID virus on our climate and our ability to deliver energy. For those of you that missed our economic webinar this week, we had close to 500 people participate and we, we heard updates from SBA on the Payroll Protection Program, UCLA on the Economic Outlook, and a firsthand response from Five Points CEO just appointed the Governor Newsom's task force on uh, the economic recovery of the state. If you missed it, please go to our LABC website or YouTube and watch it. Today, we are excited to launch our first 30 minute spotlight webinar featuring Congresswoman Maxine Waters, a good friend, a long term partner of the LABC, who has participated in many of our housing summits and DC congressional dinners over the past decade. As you know, the Congresswoman is chair of the Influential Financial Services Committee and oversees all components of the nation's housing and financial service sectors, including oversight of the Housing and Urban Development Department, the Federal Reserve Bank, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. It is important to note that she is the first woman and the first African-American woman to chair the Financial Services Committee. And during the COVID-19 crisis, she has strongly advocated for resources to be deployed to our small businesses, community banks, CDFIs, and minority depository institution. She is now calling on congressional leaders to provide protections for at-risk homeowners, renters, and the vulnerable homeless population by creating a $100 billion rental assistance fund and a $75 billion homeowner assistance. We look forward to working with the Congresswoman and her team to support a proactive policy agenda that she is putting forward. So today's format includes a presentation by the Congresswoman. It will be audio from DC, followed by some questions from our participants. Feel free to submit your questions during the Q&A, uh, during her presentation. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Wrapping up this spotlight, not only our legislative um, uh, VP will give us a short update. We want to thank Congresswoman Waters for joining us today. We know how busy she is and like many of us have family and friends battling this new virus. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Waters. Hello. Thank Hi. you. Uh, thank you to the Los Angeles Business Council for inviting me to join you on this conference call. I'd like to thank the Los Angeles Business Council Institute, President Mary Leslie, for the introduction and for making sure uh, that we have an opportunity uh, to engage on what is going on in Washington in our response uh, to COVID-19. As chairwoman <clears throat> of the Financial Services Committee of the United States House of Representatives, I want you to know uh, that we're all working around the clock to make sure that Congress provides relief to families and small businesses that are struggling in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. This is a crisis of a scale that we have not experienced in our lifetimes, and Congress must be decisive in our response. And so I'd like to start by sharing with you what we have accomplished so far and then about what I believe Congress must do next. Uh, let's talk about the CARES Act. The COVID-19 relief bill known as CARES Act, which we passed into law in March, took important steps to protect and provide relief for consumers, renters, homeowners, and people experiencing homelessness. Building upon my proposal, the bill created a direct payment for most individuals and families across the country of $1,200 for each adult and $500 for each child to help our families who are struggling during this unprecedented crisis. The bill also worked to address the shortage of key medical supplies and equipment 
by providing a $1 billion appropriation to the Defense Production Act Fund. And then, of course, as you know, housing is of great importance to me and to everyone uh, that's involved with my committee. It's a top priority. So the CARES Act included rent relief for federally assisted renters who are experiencing financial hardship. <clears throat> federally assisted renters include anyone living in public housing, receiving Section 8 rental assistance, Section 202 housing for the elderly, Section 811 housing for persons with disabilities, and housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. The bill also includes a temporary 120-day moratorium on eviction filings and late fees for renters who are living in properties with federal backing or subsidies. This protects all federally assisted renters that I've just described, as well as renters living in USDA-supported rural properties, and it would also include any other rental living in a property that has a federally backed mortgage or other federal subsidy. This includes properties that have been funded by Community Development Block Grants, our CDBG, home, low-income housing tax credits, as well as properties with mortgages that are backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Federal Housing Administration, that is FHA the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. California and Los Angeles County also have eviction bans that would go through May 31st, and unlike the federal ban, will apply to all property owners regardless of federal backing or subsidies. Los Angeles County also provides for a six-month repayment period for any back rent at the end of the moratorium. The city of Los Angeles has instituted an eviction ban that will apply citywide for all properties, regardless of federal backing or subsidies that will apply for the duration of the local emergency period and provides for a 12 month repayment period for any back rent at the end of the moratorium. So depending on where you live, you will wanna be aware of the local policies that apply to you in addition uh, to the federal protections that are in the CARES Act. Homeowners with federally backed loans also receive relief from the CARES Act through a 60-day foreclosure moratorium and mortgage forbearance for up to a year. This means that homeowners who are struggling to make their mortgage payments can reach out to their servicers today to request a forbearance. In California, Governor Newsom has secured the support of over 200 lenders in the state to commit to voluntarily providing mortgage forbearance and foreclosure relief in general. The CARES Act significantly strengthens and codifies these measures across the country. But the federal moratorium in California, or rather, not federal, but the foreclosure moratorium in California is set to expire seven days after the federal moratorium. Under the CARES Act, multifamily rental property owners, which are properties of five or more units with federally backed mortgages, will also receive forbearances for up to 90 days. Single family rental property owners, which are properties with four or less units, are eligible for the same relief as single family homeowners that I just described. In addition, thankfully, after I and other Democrats spoke out about the lack of homeless assistance in the first package for the coronavirus relief, the SHARES Act included $4 billion for homeless assistance, emergency shelter facilities for individuals experiencing homelessness often have several beds in a single room, creating prime conditions for the spread of the virus. And People experiencing homelessness are also more vulnerable in that they often have limited access to health care services. So I expect the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to prioritize this vulnerable population in delivering assistance. Let me speak now about support for small business and local territory and state governments. The legislation also took important steps 
to support small businesses and local territories and territory and state governments by providing $454 billion to the Treasury Department to support more than $4 trillion in lending by the Federal Reserve, while also ensuring that any direct loans to corporations has conditions, transparency, and independent oversight. The Federal Reserve has launched or announced 10 different emergency facilities to provide liquidity in various financial markets and to states and municipalities. Of course, of particular interest is what is known as Main Street Lending Facility, which is expected to launch in the coming weeks. Small businesses and mid-sized businesses with many as 10,000 employees would be eligible. However, I have raised concerns with the Fed last week, including they must lower the $1 million minimum loan threshold so that all the small businesses can benefit and nonprofit organizations should be eligible to. Of course, the CARES Act created the Paycheck Protection Program. That's the PPP that we're hearing so much about, which initially provided $349 billion in forgivable loans for small businesses that pay employees and keep them on the payroll. The CARES Act also provided more help for small businesses through the Small Business Administration through their program on economic injury disaster loans, known as EIDLs, and emergency advances. Small businesses apply directly to SBA for these emergency advances of up to $10,000, which does not have to be repaid and may be used to keep employees on payroll, pay for sick leave or pay debts, rent, and mortgage payments. Small businesses may also be eligible for a disaster loan of up to $2 million to help meet financial obligations and operating expenses that could have been met had the COVID-19 pandemic not occurred. These SBA programs ran out of money and needed another infusion of funds because so many small businesses are in need of assistance, which By the way, the House passed a bipartisan interim bill just yesterday. So a little bit about the interim legislation, which is known as the Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Program. The legislation we passed yesterday, which is called, again, Paycheck Protection Program and Health Care Enhancement Act, provides $370 billion in additional much-needed funding to assist struggling and small businesses through the PPP and the EIDL programs, and $100 billion to support hospitals and expand coronavirus testing. I'm very pleased that this bill specifically sets aside $60 billion of PPP funds for our nation's community development, financial institutions, known as CDFIs, minority depository institutions, known as MDIs, community banks, credit unions, and certified development companies and micro lenders to lend to the neighborhood small businesses and minority owned businesses across the country that needed funding the most. Let me just mention also that we put uh, $25 billion in there uh, for testing, for setting up a testing plan for the entire country because of the lack of testing and what all of the experts have said to us about what we need before we can really know how and when to open up businesses. Uh, We can't do this until we test and we find out exactly uh, not only who have symptoms, but those who don't have symptoms but are contagious. I've urged the Treasury Department and the SBA to remove existing impairments that kept non-bank CDFIs from participating as lenders in the PPP. That's your community development financial institutions, these small lending efforts that are in uh, at, throughout our community. And some of them are with, you know, community banks. Others may be with churches and other kinds of uh, business institutions uh, that are in the community. And so, and let's see, let's go back. Of course, let me go back. I've urged the Treasury Department and SBA to remove existing impediments that keep non-bank CDFIs from participating as lenders in the PPP, again, including 
uh, by reducing the 50 million loan volume requirement. And, you know, I can explain that later. I've also uh, been dismayed by reports that large corporations have received loans intended for small businesses. These reports came after. We also learned that huge hedge funds and private equity funds were hoping to use the PPP. This was clearly not the intent. For this reason, I've also called upon the Treasury and SBA to ensure that the $370 billion in new funding is prioritized to actual small businesses by prioritizing funding loans at least um, at less than 150000 to ensure the maximum number of small businesses and workers benefit. And this is only for CDFIs. This is not for all of the additional lending uh, operations, such as the minority banks, uh, the credit unions, and the uh, community bank. This 150000 is, again, for the CDFI. And this would ensure the maximum number of small businesses and workers benefit. The smallest of small businesses do not have access to the capital markets like larger corporations and private funds, and so they should not have to compete for these emergency funds. So you can see that the... Uh, the way that the lending was done with the PPPs has caused a lot of concerns and a lot of uh, not only uh, criticism, uh, but people who never believed that they were intended to be assisted. So now that we've passed the interim bill, we are already working on legislation for the next package of legislation to provide relief. In the next bill, it is critical for Congress to provide additional assistance to struggling homeowners, renters, landlords, and people experiencing homelessness. As a part of that effort, I and the Financial Services Committee are proposing a creation of a $100 billion rental assistance fund and $75 billion homeowner assistance fund so that struggling families are able to cover their rent, or mortgage payments, as well as utility payments. I will be working with my colleagues to ensure that these and other critical elements of the committee's proposals to protect and help our communities are included in the next coronavirus response package. So, in closing, I'd like to thank you, thank you again uh, for inviting me to join you today. And while uh, I've attempted uh, to share with you what I think of the most salient and the most important points uh, in what we have done. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have. I'm also happy to entertain any advice you may have. And in looking at all of this, you may see loopholes or you may see areas uh, that certainly could be improved or that may be misunderstood that I'd like to hear from you about. So with that, again, Thank you so very much, and I'm open for further discussion with you now. Congresswoman, thank you so much. <clears throat> that was an exhaustive list of things that you have addressed, and we want to, and we are very grateful to you for having addressed, and particularly the work you're doing with small business, the homeless, and creating accountability around these programs. I'm, we know firsthand here in Los Angeles how tough it was to access the PPP program. You're right, there was unintended barriers to small businesses in that program, um, but I think you've done a really good job of expanding who the providers are so that small businesses um, have a better opportunity, particularly those loans under 150,000 that are gonna be so critical. Um, this next work we're doing on the rental assistance fund um, and also the mortgage and utility is going to be critical to securing people's um, uh, homes over the next three to six months and for the rest of the year. As you're thinking about the work you're doing in Washington, one of the first questions we have um, is, is regarding how local governments, how, how the federal government will work with local governments regarding their budget deficits and how federal dollars can be targeted in to help stimulate local economic development and how we can create incentives to the private sector to help um, with uh, business uh, when uh, people are able to return or when we, we, we 
we have our new normal. So what do you see in terms of economic development stimulus? I know that you, you first triage the most important, keeping people safe in their homes and moving the homeless into safe living conditions. But as we move forward, are you also going to think about economic development um, stimulus? Well, absolutely. The, uh, the first thing that we did, even though it was not huge, but CDBG funds are important to our cities. And so we expanded CDBG funding and we, we gave more uh, flexibility to how that money could be spent. Uh, we know that CDBG money is uh, critical in dealing with some economic development efforts of our cities. And of course, we want our cities uh, to get more support. I want to tell you, uh, support for our cities and our states was highly and hotly just uh, debated. We don't have a lot of support uh, from uh, the Senate. Uh, uh, McConnell even said, let the cities file bankruptcy. So that erupted into a very hot debate. And yeah. we know that that's going to be one of the hottest parts of the negotiations when we go back on this CARES 2 or the fourth package. We and I believe that we've got to do more uh, to support our cities and our states. And I believe in that, uh, that gives them the opportunity uh, to do more uh, with economic development. As you know, we also um, created opportunities in the Big Cares $2 trillion plus bill for what I think is important with some of our biggest employers in our city and in other cities, looking at the airports uh, and the airlines. And we wanted to make sure uh, that not only uh, did they have support in this uh, legislation, and it was debated by some who first started out by saying that that $500 billion uh, that was identified that Mnuchin uh, basically had uh, some influence over and the ability uh, to make the, uh, uh, the loans or uh, the support. Uh, but what they didn't realize is that all of that money uh, was targeted toward the employees, keeping the employees sick leave and making sure uh, that, you know, one of our biggest economic engines uh, continues to run and run as smoothly as possible. So, yes, we're concerned about economic development. We think that that is central uh, to the uh, stability of any city, of any location. And some of us will be fighting very hard against um, McConnell and Republicans who do not believe that we have a responsibility to our cities. He claims and he uh, basically incorrectly and falsely talks about cities being irresponsible and creating debt and not spending their money wisely and not having it, our responsibility to bail them out. I don't think that way. I think uh, most of the people on my side of the aisle don't think that way, and we're going to be fighting for you uh, and for our cities. Uh, and our business people to have our support. Thank you for that. And, and, and whatever we can do to support you in that, we would like to do. Um, uh, a new question, uh, Congresswoman, is back to the issue of homeless and homeless services. Can you speak to how the crisis will allow homeless service providers to access permanent housing for their clients so the most vulnerable population doesn't end up back on the streets after the initial phase of the crisis? Well, I have to tell you that this is a discussion that I've been having, particularly with some of the smaller cities in my district, uh, cities like Hawthorne and Lawndale. Here's what's happening. Uh, they have worked with uh, the state and the county and the city, I suppose, and everybody in helping to support opportunities for the homeless uh, to be in hotels and hotels that have been cooperative in identifying uh, a certain percentage of rooms that they have made available to the homeless. And uh, this has helped tremendously in helping to get some of our homeless off the street. But now what they're saying to me is, and so what happens after federal funding? Where are they going to go? And what are you going to do? And so uh, we have not been able to give them the concrete answers that I would like to see, but I know this. 
I know that we're going to have to continue to think about what we do with the homeless uh, in certain ways, understanding that not only we need more low-income housing, not only do we need supportive services, not only do we need to think about how this money is allocated uh, to the various um, programs uh, that basically support this population, but we're going to have to, again, at the top of this, put more money into it. We've got to build more housing that for supportive services for all of those who may have uh, mental and emotional problems that are on the street. Uh, we've got to have low-income housing simply for some who are homeless who work every day but make minimum wages and they cannot pay the first and last month's rent in order to get in a place. But now, even if they had the first and last month's rent, we have many localities that just don't have any that's available. They're 100% occupied. And so that's a discussion and a debate that we're going to have to have about what we're going to do about homelessness, where we're going to put this money, and how we're going to um, increase a supportive services for them. It's an ongoing debate that we've got to be involved in. And we need the cities, really, we need the cities to tell us about how they operate with this. You know, we hear complaints all the time. Everybody is competing for the money under the, our uh, a city's uh, jurisdiction, under the organization that's, um, whose responsibility it is uh, to uh, make the uh, allocations for homelessness. So I want to hear from you all if you can think of ways, better ways uh, to do it. I know that the business community is very concerned. You know, I've spent a lot of time uh, with business leaders uh, in downtown Los Angeles, for example, and of course, knowing and understanding what's happening on so-called Skid Row. But Skid Row has expanded all over everywhere. It's all throughout not only our city, but in our counties. It's not just downtown. Uh, however, you know, uh, I know that a lot of attempts are being made. We were very generous in our city and our county in uh, making sure that we raise money through our voting, our propositions uh, to fund these efforts. I also know that it has been difficult to get uh, developers uh, to do low-income housing because of the impediments uh, that are sometimes uh, put in the way by cities when they don't realize what they're doing in increasing the cost of development that really scares some of our developers who would do low-income housing. They cannot do low-income housing when it's costing $500,000 to develop low-income units uh, per unit. Uh, they can't do that. And so I have been also trying to focus on what we could do to really have true one-stop shops where our uh, would-be developers would not have to run around from licensing to other departments and uh, get held up and be told that they've got to spend more money on uh, things like removing posts and wires and hydrants and what have you. So this is a, a big problem uh, to get these low-income units. Now, I do see some signs in L.A., in my own area where I live, right at 87th, I believe, is in Vermont. A huge uh, development has just gone up. And as I travel around the city, I see uh, that we're making, we're making some progress. It's just that the demand is so high. I don't know that if, we, uh, if we're able to develop at the rate that we're developing, that it's going to help us to end homelessness. Uh, but I applaud the progress that we're making, we need more. We need every vacant lot in a database and every owner approached and uh, 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 called on uh, to see if we can acquire those lots and that we can put units on them. And they don't have to be, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 units. If we can acquire places, uh, smaller lots, they can put up 10 units. And I think we need to publicize even more the fact that the city of Los Angeles uh, opened up with policy that would allow homeowners to uh, con 
convert garages and build in their backyards, as I understand it. I think that could be a great help. And I think as I travel through, I see homes that are sitting on double lots, et cetera, that maybe would do it if they really understood the program. I think we need a lot more publicity about that. And so that's a long answer to what we're going to do about homelessness. Yes, but it was a thorough answer, and we appreciate that. And we, we have information we can share with you and your staff concerning several of the things you just raised. We've just done a whole series on homelessness and housing, and I think there's quite a few efforts. And that one, one of the things that COVID has done for us is it's double, tripled, quadrupled the amount of uh, beds we have right now for the homeless. We've never seen... Oh, very good. Right, we've never seen this many people housed. And, and a lot of that has to do with the federal dollars that you've made available and the willingness of our governor and our mayor and our supervisors to, 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 you know, to go strong here during COVID and bring people in who wanna come in and get them housed. So how, what happens afterwards is gonna be critical. And I think you just identified quite a few issues and areas that we are also concerned about um, and we'd love to work with you on that. I'd like to go back for one minute to a question that's being asked right now with your financial uh, hat on, Congresswoman. Um, the, 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 the questioner's asking that they're hearing that banks are beginning to pause their lending and investment activity. Um, they're very concerned about this um, in terms of what this means in terms of addressing Community Reinvestment Act goals and community lending and investment in low and moderate income communities. What can Congress do to help intervene, ensure that the banks do not stop lending and um, provide investment activity, especially in critical communities during this time? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I've discovered as a chair of the Financial Services Committee is that we have to constantly be involved with banks uh, and this is not about a particular issue, but it's about changing their thinking and their attitudes about banking and what they have done traditionally and historically and how changes have to be made in the way that they think about banking, period. Even with PPP, in the way that the banks have lent the money, they started out with their preferred uh, VIP customers, with their concierge customers, and they took care of them. They put together a portal that they would have access to, and that's why a disproportionate amount of this money went on the high end of lending. And so even with that, uh, one of the problems that we ran into is that uh, many of our motels, hotels, et cetera, found a way to get around uh, the limit on um, being able to access these funds from SBA to companies of less than 500. And so what they did was, and we kind of discovered this late, what they did was working with the banks, uh, what they did was uh, create an opportunity for, say, a motel or a hotel with 10, 15, 20 locations that each one of them would be considered eligible because each one of them had less than 500. And so you can see how the concierge or the premier uh, type customers who had these kinds of operations that they could, whether they're uh, franchises or what have you, each one could be considered eligible because each one of them had less than 500. Basically is what absorbed so much money and what's caused so many of our small business people to stand in line and finally for all the money to be spent while small business people didn't even have an opportunity to get their applications in or even if they got them in, got left standing with a number. So we are painfully aware that we have to work very closely to eliminate certain kinds of activities, certain kinds of thinking, uh, working with our banks and uh, we are also focused on the Community Redevelopment Act, which I think you referenced. And OCC has rolled out with its proposal uh, that we're trying to get them to reconsider uh, because we do not want banks uh, all of a sudden to be put in a position where those who are out of compliance 
for the most part, can still be considered in compliance, uh, and they are not. They would be. They would be in compliance with the new kind of regulations and laws that are being proposed by OCC. But in our laws that we have now, they would not be in compliance because what they're saying is they could they could be out of compliance up to 50 percent and still be considered excellent or okay. So we've got to deal with that. We've got to deal with the banks not being put in a position where they could do lending far outside of these communities, maybe even in other states. And so we know that we have a problem with this administration trying to make sure that the Community Redevelopment Act, it really, uh, the community, I think it's, yeah, does what it's supposed to do. And uh, that's a problem. And we're working on it. We have visited uh, over at a hearing with FDCI, who is agreeing with them. But we want you to know that the feds have said they're on our side. They don't agree with the way that this proposal is going, because it would put banks in a position where they wouldn't have to lend uh, in the communities that they're supposed to serve. And so when you take a look again at some of the traditions and the ways that, uh, you know, not only the banks, but the higher end of economic uh, concerns work. Even though everybody talks about uh, support for small businesses and consumers, uh, it really doesn't work that way. And so I'm trying to work to undo uh, some of these systems and some of this thinking so that we can make sure uh, that we are being fair and that we are, uh, you know, helping to support opportunities for every class. Uh, in our society. Uh, I have no problems with people making money. Uh, that's what business is all about. But I do have a problem with inequality. And that's what we're working on. Well, we thank you for that. And, and, and thank you for um, the amount of time that you're generously giving us today and for answering all these questions. Should I give, I'm gonna give you one last question. Um, this is regarding CDBG um, being used as rent subsidy on caps uh, at 80% of AMI, would the proposed 100 billion fund allow funding for families above 80% AMI to participate? I don't know for sure. I think I have some staff on the line that have to connect us. Uh, Charlotte, do you know the answer to that? Yes, so we're actually taking that up to 120% of AMI, but note that if someone's income is zero, then they would automatically qualify for the emergency. Um, I'm sorry, you were asking about CDBG or were you asking about the emergency? No, it's home? CDBG, it's CDBG. Oh, Esther, do you know that? Is Esther on the line? Hello? I believe she's on the line, but um, we can follow back up on that question. Well, I know that we created some flexibility, but I don't know if that was included. We'll follow up on it and we'll get, I'll get back to you on Monday. That'd be terrific. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Congressman, for being with us. And, and we look forward to being with you in person soon. Um, uh, you've always been with us every year, I think, for our, our housing summit. And that's your, right. your leadership's been invaluable. And unfortunately, we did not make it to DC this year uh, because of COVID. Um, yes. but yeah, but, but we're happy that you represent us here in Los Angeles and that we can be with you again when it's appropriate and we appreciate your leadership and we will work with you in any way that's helpful to you, um, on these important issues and your staff. Well, thank you so very much. And I welcome your visits here. I look forward to it. And of course, you know, I'm very concerned about our city, uh, and, uh, I want to make sure uh, that we can do everything that we can uh, to strengthen our city. And I'm worried about the layoffs uh, that have been announced. Uh, that, that is something that I would like us to be able to help if we can get the money that I think we ought to be able to get to support our cities and our state. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, just real quickly, Esther um, was on the line, but she, um, she can't speak, but she emailed me the answer to your question. And right. the answer is that CDBG is flexible to serve over 80% AMI. However, a certain percentage of the money has to be used for under that threshold. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. And, and uh, Congresswoman, uh, fly safely today. My understanding is you're coming back. And thank you for your vote yesterday. On, on the stimulus package. And You're so welcome.
Yes. They, Work with us on our next uh, on our next uh, cares too. Yeah, no, we'll be right behind you, supporting you, and we thank you so much for your, your work, which is so critical right You're now. You're so welcome. Thank you, and yeah. goodbye now. Goodbye. Now, I'm going to let Adam Lane wrap up um, on what the legislative um, uh, uh, issues are that LABC is active in. We'd welcome anyone participating today on the call, particularly our members. Um, and other organizations who are interested uh, to join us in these activities. Adam. Thank you, Mary. And uh, I want to thank Congresswoman Waters and her team for the informative discussion. Uh, it helps having big leaders and advocates uh, in DC and we're lucky to have the Congresswoman. So uh, we look forward to partnering with them on a series of issues, namely as she discussed small business, uh, homeowner assistance, renter assistance, and anything we can do to protect our homeless population in the next stimulus package. We are very much concerned that we need to start planning now about how we provide beds for our homeless and at-risk uh, population after the end of the public health emergency. For the next round of stimulus, we're gonna be calling on Congress and the federal administration to include an additional $11.5 billion allocation for emergency solutions grants on top of the $4 billion that was approved in the original CARES Act. Emergency solutions grants are provided to states, counties, and cities to fund the development and operation of emergency shelters rapid rehousing, outreach services, and rental assistance, among other items. We're gonna also call for an increase in low-income housing tax credits, which are crucial to many of our affordable housing developers, home funding, and CDBG grants. At a time when our housing programs are becoming more and more, at a time when housing is becoming more and more unaffordable, the programs are gonna be crucial to increasing our stock of affordable housing. We already sent a letter to Governor Newsom uh, with a coalition of business organizations requesting among other things to, that the federal government be urged to allocate increased funding for housing and homelessness. And as many of you know, uh, we have a 501c3 research arm, the LABC Institute, and we've been working over the past two years on an initiative to leverage major public infrastructure investments and in incoming sports and entertainment events to open up contracting and procurement opportunities for small and medium sized businesses, particularly those that are diverse women and minority owned. The initiative dubbed Compete for LA would combine the creation of a procurement clearinghouse with a small business engagement and outreach strategy. With an impending decrease in government revenues, especially at the local and state level, ensuring that the secured investments we do have uh, reach our local businesses is gonna be more crucial than ever. We plan to work with congressional partners and SBA leadership to see if we can leverage any of these funding sources we just talked about as a means to support these local programs. You can learn more about the initiative on our website and I'm putting the link for you all in the chat. You can find it on our economic development page. Uh, the last item we're really concerned about, uh, especially at the federal level, is the impact COVID-19 is having on job retention and growth in the clean energy market. The most recent numbers in March showed us that we lost nearly 107,000 jobs in the clean energy industry, with 6,500 of those coming from the solar industry alone. So a major priority for us moving forward will be an extension of the solar ITC program to protect projects that have been delayed and will face a reduced tax credit. Unfortunately, while advocates worked to get uh, provisions put in the original CARES Act, it did not make it into the final bill. So we'll be sending a letter to congressional leaders and the IRS, urging either an extension of the ITC and requesting the IRS to declare supply chain disruptions as an excusable disruption, which defined under federal re re regulations would protect projects from losing access to credits and it would provide certainty to investors. It is a simple uh, declaration of an excusable disruption, disruption that would make a huge difference. So that's all the updates I have for you all on the federal level. If you have any questions regarding uh, these or any other issues you think we should be tracking both federally at the state and local level, feel free to reach out to me via email at alane at labusinesscouncil.org. Uh, thank you and I'll pass it back to Mary to close. Thank you, Adam. That's really important. Um, and I'd urge any of you that are interested in these issues to join us. Um, we are, we are being fairly aggressive in our advocacy and staying current with things that we're concerned about, particularly in the area of housing, homelessness, um, uh, sustainability, and um, economic development. Uh, for those of you that um, are uh, following our webinars, I would um, invite you to join us on April 30th next week. We're going to have our first sustainability webinar featuring Reiko Kier from the Department of Water and Power, who's the head of the uh, power system, and also Tom Budema, the founder and CEO of Eight Minute Energy, 
as well as Leanne Randolph, the CPUC member responsible for renewable energy. I think this group is going to be very important to informing us about what they see is happening, the COVID response um, to climate change and energy, and, and we would welcome your participation. Uh, that invite will go out today, and then also you can mark your calendars for May 7th. Uh, we will be returning to our um, our Wells Fargo hosted series uh, on homelessness and housing, and we will have County Supervisor Hilda Solis uh, and Sol from the Community um, uh, California Community Foundation and Christina Miller, the Deputy Mayor here in Los Angeles uh, for homelessness. So with that, um, be safe, stay home, have a great weekend. It looks like summer has arrived in Los Angeles, and um, we're thinking of all of you, and we look forward to seeing you again. So thank you.